I'm John Coates. I teach here at the law school uh, as well as over at the business school. Uh, to my left is Ron Fine from Free Speech for People. You, what's your official title these days? Legal director. Legal director, excellent. Um, heavily involved in uh, both litigation and policy reform efforts in the space that we're going to talk about. And to my right, uh, my, my dear friend and colleague, Charles Freed, who has had so many different um, uh, roles in his legal career. I'm not even going to attempt to capture them other than to say uh, he's um, an astonishingly learned um, commentator on constitutional law and uh, related topics such as today's topic, which is foreign uh, involvement in U.S. elections, particularly through corporations. So that's the introduction. I think we're going to start with Charles to maybe do some general, um, general framing of mm -hmm. the overall topic, and then I'll say something about um, from my angle, which is more business and corporate law, and then Ron hopefully will turn and talk about um, uh, kind of what's happening in the world relevant to the topics we're going to cover. So, Charles. To begin with, please don't be offended if I leave early because I've got a class uh, and I've got to help set that up. Well, we are. Oh, Mike, maybe. Oh, you, yep. you want a mic? Oh, okay. Let's just turn it on. Yep. Uh, the U.S. is famous as being exceptional in its total deregulation of speech. Uh, we allow hate speech. We allow all kinds of speech, which uh, in other democratic, uh, democratic nations uh, is limited and controlled uh, or, or just criminal. Well, in that context, it's remarkable that forever, we have been very, very hostile to foreign intervention in our politics. Our politics may be disgusting, but it's our politics. And, uh, and that goes all the way back to the famous XYZ f f affair in 1798, which I won't go into, but it's when Talleyrand, who Franklin referred to as a silk stocking full of shit, uh, uh, <laughs> tried to extort a bribe from John Marshall. Uh, and, well, I won't go into that story, but it's a wonderful one. But it, it's a long hostility. There are two cases which spell out the current frame of things. Uh, Blumen against Federal Election Commission, which deals with 2 U.S.C. 441E, and that has to do with foreign intervention uh, in American campaigns, and by the way, that includes federal, state, and local, so it's, uh, it's not just federal, uh, and it talks about intervention which involves uh, electioneering communications. So it's got to be pretty close to saying vote for or against a particular person, and it's got to be within a particular time frame. But in, and, uh, in the case which dealt with this, there's a wonderful opinion uh, in, uh, I forget the date, uh, very recently, uh, by Judge Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit, and this was uh, affirmed without opinion, just straightforward affirmed by the Supreme Court. Giving the history of our uh, extreme allergy to foreign intervention in our government, and that's a very it's a very large and all-embracing opinion, which I think is, in a way, a charter for reform and further legislation, uh, should the Congress ever have the stomach for it, but also for state and local uh, legislation. Uh, and Kavanaugh talks about how uh, the Supreme Court has said that we can keep foreign nationals from 
being high school teachers, from holding public office, uh, from uh, being police officers. In other words, uh, we can keep them out of our government. And it's in that context that he said that this kind of uh, regulation is entirely uh, familiar and proper and constitutional. The other case uh, grows out of the Nazi uh, propaganda campaign in the United States in the late 30s and onwards, and uh, it uh, created a law which is, um, and give you the citation to it, but the case is Mies v. Keen in 1987, and it's part of the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which requires foreigners who seek to influence um, American opinion uh, through writings and so on and so forth, to label it as political propaganda. And uh, a, uh, a, a California state legislator who wanted to show some Canadian, Canadian, uh, not Russian, uh, Canadian films on the environment uh, and on nuclear war, uh, was re he didn't want to have to label this as political propaganda. And the Supreme Court, in a opinion with only three dissents, said, no, 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 the hostility to foreign intervention uh, in our political process is such that that's perfectly all right. Well, uh, I think that indicates that there is a Supreme Court charter for considerable regulation and considerable intervention. So I'll stop there. Terrific. Thank you, Charles. Um, so I'm going to pick up the story with the fact that, um, to reiterate, we, we do have existing laws banning foreign governments, companies, and people um, from contributing or spending money in our elections. And also, separately, um, requiring, as Charles just indicated, even basic speech acts to be particularly labeled, and further barring foreign individuals from playing direct roles in campaigns in this country. They can't manage um, uh, uh, an election campaign, again, at federal, state, or local levels. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court separately, um, uh, in its Citizens United decision, um, uh, has, if not created a loophole, at least invited companies to consider how to create loopholes uh, through corporate structure. Um, and among other things, foreign entities can and do create, invest in, or partner with companies that are nominally based uh, or nominally located in the United States, um, but use foreign control or influence to direct those companies as a way of laundering or camouflaging uh, their involvement in our election system. And so if you think about the way a corporation functions, um, at the one extreme, it can simply be just a piece of paper helping shield identity of the sponsors and, and, and managers of the company. Um, if it's a real company, if it actually has operations, then you start thinking about ways in which uh, board representation can give a foreign investor influence or control, um, contracts and uh, lending arrangements that can give practical economic power to um, influence a company's behavior, and ownership of significant amounts of stock, which can also uh, create uh, a strong influence channel for the shareholder here, maybe a corporate shareholder, foreign corporation, foreign-backed um, corporation uh, into the U.S. Sometimes these channels get uncovered in um, accidental ways. So for example, just to give you a, a tangible illustration, mm -hmm. Airbnb, the, um, the house lending platform, um, dumped $11 million into a super PAC dedicated to fighting New York uh, regulation back in 2015 and 16 when New York did in fact ultimately pass uh, significant regulation of 
of the homestay industry in New York. At the time and, and today, it's a privately held company. As a result, we don't really know the full ownership structure of who's behind Airbnb. We do know the founder. We know a number of uh, companies that are proud to advertise that they invested in Airbnb because its value has grown so much. One of them, a company called uh, DST Global, late stage venture capital fund, um, advertises the fact that it invested in Airbnb. It's come up in a number of news articles and Airbnb doesn't deny that. Um, where is DST based? It's a, uh, well, it depends on which news article you believe. It's to a privately based, uh, privately organized company. It's either based in Hong Kong or London or Moscow or possibly the U.S. It's unclear um, from public records. Um, it is clear that it was created by Yuri Milner, who's a Russian, still living in Russia for the most part, although occasionally in the United States. He's a billionaire. And he has raised a great deal of money personally and for DST from the Russian government, including through Russian sta uh, state-owned uh, bank uh, that Russian sponsors. DST also invested in Twitter and in Facebook, um, significant amounts of money before they went public. It says that they've sold off their share since those companies went public, but I'll come back to we actually don't have any real way right now of verifying whether that's true. If you take aggregate data from the Internal Revenue Service, there's at least 83,000 separate corporate tax returns filed by U.S. companies which are controlled 50% or more by foreign owners. Um, they had book value, book, you know, book asset value, so maybe significantly more than this, but a minimum of $12 trillion of assets under their control. So foreign influence over U.S. corporations based, incorporated, acting here, and which as a first pass would not be directly covered by the laws that I've already mentioned and that Charles um, mentioned, um, uh, are a massive source of potential influence in U.S. elections. Um, give you an example. You, you all know the beer called it for a while, it was called Budweiser, and then it was relabeled America. Uh, I think they're back to Budweiser again. I've, I haven't kept track. That's uh, a beer sold by a company called Imbev. Imbev is the parent company of Anheuser-Busch. Imbev is Belgian, and uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch only used to be a U.S. company. Um, many American companies have also themselves become foreign, in the last 20 years as a way of evading or reducing, depending on your perspective, U.S. taxes. Um, and they do that, um, have, in order to do that effectively under tax law, they really do have to relocate. They can't simply shuffle some paper around and say they're foreign. They actually have to have headquarters and the board meetings have to occur overseas and the majority of their shareholders, or, or at least some significant percentage of their shareholders, have to be foreign. And they typically do that uh, through a merger with a foreign company. So in fact, the foreign influence over those companies uh, grows significantly as a result of those transactions. And they, however, continue to have massive, large numbers of U.S. subsidiaries. A couple of years ago, Ron and a couple of enterprising law students from Harvard and I um, combed through the SEC filings among public U.S. companies. These are companies that formally are U.S. companies, formally listed here. Uh, and in the S&P 500, which is a representative index of those public companies, 1 in 11 have a foreign institutional investor with more than 5% of the stock. Now, 5% might not sound like a, a lot, but in fact, most public companies don't have more than one or two 5% owners, and they do have significant influ influence, um, either informally or formally, uh, over the boards of the companies that the 5% owner has stock in. Um, there are even companies with significantly higher uh, foreign ownership among U.S. public companies. There are, in fact, nine that have more than 10% foreign ownership um, blocks and three with more than 20%. So I'll give you an illustration of that. Morgan Stanley, U.S. sounding investment bank, largest shareholder, Mitsubishi UFG, uh, UFJ, excuse me, uh, based in Japan, 22% block holder by far the biggest shareholder of Morgan Stanley, clearly influential 
uh, in its operations um, clearly would be responsive to the interests and inclinations of the people at Mitsubishi. I'll give you another example. Level 3 Communications, another public company, has two different uh, Singapore investors, each owning 18 percent, aggregating 36 percent. So that's, you know, hard to get away from the fact that that's a Singapore controlled company, and yet if you look formally at Level 3, it's a U.S. incorporated operation, and uh, uh, its board is mostly composed of U.S. citizens. Um, let me give you one final example to, to tie it off, and then I'll turn it over to Ron. Um, uh, some of you may have been following lately Cambridge Analytica, <laughs> which has been in the papers for all kinds of reasons. Um, one reason is that uh, one of their internal employees uh, has gone to the press and leaked uh, a nice memo, which summarizes some of the law Charles summarized, written by Bracewell and Pat uh, Giuliani, excuse me, used to be Bracewell and Patterson, um, before Rudy Giuliani joined them, um, a law firm in New York. That, that is that Rudy Giuliani? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His law firm, a uh, fellow named Lawrence, I assume, Levy, um, uh, wrote a memo to the th uh, three of the principals of Cambridge Analytica, Steve Bannon, Rebecca Mercer of the Mercer family, very wealthy American family, and Alexander Nix, who was the CEO of Cambridge Analytica and a UK citizen, and therefore not permitted under our law to directly participate in our elections. Um, in the memo, there's a summary of the Cambridge Analytica ownership and governance structure, and they clearly designed this organization to um, uh, address U.S. law. It's a U.S. Delaware limited liability company. It has five members, as LLC directors are called, they're equivalent to a board of directors. Five of the directors, three of them American citizens, Steve Bannon and two Mercers. And then there are two other directors who are called common directors and are given slightly different powers. Both uh, are, are UK citizens. Alan, Alexander Nix is one. He's the CEO. Um, now, that alone wouldn't address all the potential problems of what Charles outlined because there's a separate requirement that a foreign agent, an individual, also not participate in our elections. So how do they address that? Well, they purported to set up internal firewalls where Alexander, the CEO, would not be allowed to make management decisions uh, involving any campaign in which Cambridge Analytica participated uh, in the United States. But instead, those decisions would be made by other people, and he would just simply sit back, I guess, and watch. Um, now, anyone who has worked with a privately held company knows that if the CEO um, is nominally walled off from activity, Okay, you see where that goes. In addition, <laughs> Cambridge Analytica's ownership is a significantly, uh, a significant owner is a UK company, which licenses all of the IP that Cambridge Analytica needs to run its algorithms and do its work, another channel of foreign influence over that company. And if that weren't all enough, you actually have, and I'm going to play a real quick video clip, um, in the uh, gotcha uh, news coverage um, that was done of Cambridge Analytica, you have a recording of one of the officers talking about um, how they would address secrecy concerns um, that might arise. Let's get the lights off here. Um, there we go. It might arise. No, that didn't quite do it. Um, let's see if we can get all of them off. Notes. There we go. Um, if someone were to worry about Cambridge Analytical's role in the election that the journalist was pretending to have underway, there was a, uh, a spy journalist sent in. Here's a very, very quick clip. Um, this is a Cambridge Analytica top officer. And for a client worried about anyone discovering Cambridge Analytica's involvement, they've an answer for that too. It may be that we have to contract under a different name. Uh, For Cambridge Analytica. A different entity with a different name. So that no record exists with our name attached to this. Entity. You get the idea. Okay, so explicit planning around using corporations to 
shelter the actual identity of foreign individuals in this case directly interfering in U.S. elections. Elsewhere in the same video interview, the, uh, the CEO himself proudly described sending um, young ladies to the uh, hotel's rooms of uh, campaign officials in various countries in order to entrap them uh, into embarrassing uh, behavior, which would then be used to help defeat them in, in elections. So that's a company who unequivocally was involved directly in our last presidential election and in a number of senatorial elections and gubernatorial elections in the United States. Um, that's a company that in public is admitting to essentially evading law um, through the use of corporate shells. And so with that, the question becomes, what, if else, what else could we do in this country as a policy response to the problem of camouflage uh, of that kind? I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ron Fine, Legal Director of Free Speech for People. Uh, for the students here, I'll make a shameless pitch that uh, we still have time if you are interested in a summer internship. Eligible. Yes, that, that is shameless. Uh, and if uh, the summer public interest funding isn't enough and you want to do a split summer, we're open to that too. And also a clinical externship uh, in the fall could also happen. So when we first started working on this issue in the spring of 2016, a lot of people thought it was hypothetical. Uh, and part of the issue is that I think until recently people thought of foreign influence in elections in terms of hacking the vote count, in terms of changing recorded votes. But what we've seen increasingly is that it can equally apply to changing minds. And the way that I think of this when it comes to corporate activity is that advertising today is not just about Madison Avenue and, and Don Draper. It includes much more subtle techniques with names like guerrilla marketing and viral marketing, uh, techniques that entities like Cambridge Analytica specialize in, that I'm sure everybody in this room would say that they're immune from persuasion. They can't possibly be influenced by these um, highly developed techniques. But as the uh, father of public relations, uh, Edward Bernays, noted 100 years ago, the very same techniques that can be used to effectively sell soap and cigarettes can also be used to influence public opinion in a democracy. And there's a reason that advertising is a $200 billion industry, and that's because, by and large, it works. So the example that we've all been drawn to from 2016 is what happened on Facebook. And obviously, not all of the details of this are fully known. But among them, we do know that there were over 3,000 ads from a shadowy Russian entity called the Internet Research Agency, LLC, a limited liability company based in St. Petersburg, Russia. And what we know about this suggests that at least one foreign government has discovered a relatively low-cost way to amplify divisions within the uh, U.S. electorate and perhaps to influence votes. But what's even worse, as Professor Coates has pointed out, is that foreign actors can leverage ownership stakes in American companies to uh, influence our elections through the use of corporate dollars. And an example that I'd like to highlight is Uber. So Uber is a controversial company in many ways, but they certainly spend a lot in local elections. And Uber, for example, spent millions of dollars in an election in Austin, Texas recently on a ballot measure that would have, uh, if, if it had passed, it would have helped Uber's business. And it probably would have drawn riders away from Austin's public transit system, which is more fuel efficient, meaning that if this uh, had passed, it would have resulted in more gasoline being used. I'm not here to talk about the pros and cons of this particular ballot measure in Austin, Texas, only to say that after uh, just a few weeks after Uber had spent all this money in the election, they revealed that they had taken an investment of $3.5 billion from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, of course, is an oil-rich country, which has long involved itself in U.S. politics. So, for example, in 2014, it hired the uh, chairman of a major congressional super PAC as its top lobbyist. And now it has a seat on the board of a company that spends millions of dollars in municipal elections. That $3.5 billion got it 5% ownership and a, a seat on the board. But this issue is not only about problematic petro states. Um, and I could give other examples involving Citgo, which is uh, wholly owned by the, the government of, of Venezuela. Uh, but this also involves even countries that we think of as our close allies. And Canada is a great example. It is hard to conceive of a country 
with whom the U.S. has a closer relationship than Canada. And yet, as we can see from uh, the Mies v. Keene case, that involved Canada. The Blumen case involved Canadians. Uh, in 2012, a Connecticut-based subsidiary of a Canadian investment firm uh, donated a million dollars to Mitt Romney's super PAC. Obviously, Mitt Romney didn't win the election, but that million dollars would have been noticed. Right? That, that gets some influence. And I think the general principle is that this is not just a matter of high stakes spy craft and state influence operations. It's that no investor from any foreign country should be in a position to exercise influence over a politically active American company. So what are some solutions? So as a base level, transparency can help us to at least find the problem. And there are uh, some bills in Congress that have not yet passed, um, names like the Disclose Act and the Get Foreign Money Out of U.S. Elections Act. Uh, California recently passed a disclosure legislation. That can help at least identify who is paying for what. Um, but sometimes we, ne we need to go further. So the law, as Professor Fried identified, when it comes to foreign national directly spending money in elections. The law doesn't say Vladimir Putin can spend as much as he wants in US elections as long as he reports it appropriately on the required forms. The law prohibits the Russian government from spending money in US elections. So the efforts that have uh, taken place to uh, address this problem on a substantive level have been mostly stymied at the federal level. So Ellen Weintraub is a commissioner of the Federal Election Commission. And she waged a, a lonely battle at the FEC uh, to bring attention to this problem. She organized a, a day-long forum in the summer of 2016, which Professor Coates testified on the problem of corporate political spending and foreign influence. Unfortunately, the FEC is, is divided, and it did not move forward, uh, as she was unable to persuade enough of her fellow commissioners. In Congress, uh, again, the statutory uh, uh, the statutory uh, approaches that could address this at a substantive level have not even come close to passage. So in the meantime, cities and states are not waiting for the federal government to act. And that brings us to St. Petersburg. Now in this case, I don't mean St. Petersburg, Russia, where the Internet Research Agency LLC is based, but rather St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, which is a city that is larger than you think, uh, but it is not the largest city in the US by any means. Uh, and after a, a year and a half of an effort uh, spearheaded by uh, Free Speech for People at the national level and by uh, local allies at the grassroots level, uh, including the League of Women Voters of St. Petersburg, uh, the American Promise Tampa Bay chapter, and, and other key local activists, in November 2017, the City Council of St. Pete passed a, a groundbreaking local ordinance that effectively bans political spending in city elections by corporations with a specified level of foreign ownership. And I'll, I'll tell you a, a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, just so you know, other efforts going on. Connecticut, last year, uh, one house of the legislature passed the same bill that we helped develop. Uh, this year, it's been reintroduced. Uh, Massachusetts currently has a bill pending in the Massachusetts State Senate that we worked on with Common Cause of Massachusetts. So let me tell you what these bills do. These bills identify a category known as a foreign influenced corporation. And that is defined as meeting one of three tests. One test could be that a foreign national is directly or indirectly involved in making decisions about political spending by the corporation. A uh, second category is if a single foreign investor owns 5% or more of the company's stock. And this 5% threshold is one that's generally recognized in corporate laws, one at which uh, an investor can exercise influence over the corporate governance. And at that level, we presume that the, the corporation is potentially subject to foreign influence. And then the third category is if a group of foreign investors collectively, even if they're not working together, add up to 20% ownership. Uh, that 20% uh, not coincidentally matches a threshold in the Federal Communications Act of 1934, which prohibits broadcast licensees, TV stations, common carriers, from having more than 20% foreign ownership. So if a company, corporation, LLC, or similar entity meets any of these three categories, it's deemed a foreign-influenced corporation. And then it's prohibited from spending money directly in the election or from contributing to an entity like a super PAC that would spend the money itself. 
Uh, obviously, the, the premise of this law is not xenophobia. It's not to discourage foreign investment. What it's to do is to ensure democratic self-government. So this legislation obviously is not going to cut off every possible route for foreign influence into our democracy, uh, whether from corporations or anyone else. There are other routes. Um, there's lobbying. There's large donations by foreign governments, foreign corporations to influential think tanks. Um, contributions to social welfare nonprofit groups, uh, and there are obviously going to be other possibilities. But this is a, a targeted solution to a key aspect of the problem. And when we started working on this aspect of the problem in 2016, people said it was seemed a little hypothetical. Now people aren't saying that so much anymore. 